Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you to be here to our Satellite Symposium on uh, from Olea Medical Academy. And so today we will uh, talk about emid proton transfer weighted MRI. And uh, the title of uh, this symposium, From Diagnosis to Treatment Response, the Molecular Added Value of Emid Proton Transfer Weighted MRI. So the meetings, let's say that we are a little bit late, but uh, the meeting will be more or less uh, one hour and a half. So we have uh, three speakers. Uh, uh, great key speaker today. So we have uh, Peter Van Zai from Kennedy Creek Institute and John Oxford University uh, that will uh, talk about basic and history of APT weighted contrast for neuroimaging. Then we have uh, uh, Professor Sotiros Bizdas from UCL Hospital, NHS, uh, that will talk about APT imaging as clinical tool for primary brain tumor staging and treatment monitoring. And finally, we will have uh, Dr. Luciani Kelly from La PTS Alpetria Hospital in Paris. And she will talk about APT weighted imaging in the distinction between radionecrotic and tumor progressing brain metastasis. So there will be uh, all these three speech. And finally, we will have a unique uh, round table Q&A session. So I would like to introduce you to the first case speaker that I think that everybody knows, but I will just do an, uh, a quick introduction. So uh, Peter Van Zai is a professor in the Department of Radiology, Oncology and Biophysics at John Hopkins University Medical School and the founding director of uh, Kirby Research Center for Functional Brain Imaging at Kennedy Krieger Institute. Uh, Peter is a fellow of, uh, and gold medal winner of the International Society for Magnetic Resonance in Medicine, ESMRM, and, in, and the International Society of Magnetic Resonance. Uh, he previously served on the board or trustees of the ESMRM and on the executive committee of the Experimental M NMR Conference. He resides on the editorial boards of the journals, Magnetic Resonance in Medicine, as an associate editor, Journal of Magnetic Resonance as associate editor, and MRL in biomedicine. So uh, his research focuses on developing new methodologies for MRI, including functional MRI and magnetic resonance spectroscopy to study brain function, chemistry, and physiology. So he holds many patents, including several system MRI approaches, such as the APT-weighted MRI technology. So his goal is to transform these technologies into fast methods that are compatible with the time available for multimodal clinical diagnosis using MRI. So, Peter. So uh, I'll start with, uh, probably everybody knows, but just to make sure, a little explanation of the CEST contrast. And uh, what is CES doing? It was invented by uh, Bob Balaban and Ward, and they had a paper in 2020. And basically what it comes down to is uh, it visualizes low concentration uh, molecules through the water signal. So this is an example. Say you have a millimolar compound. Uh, here I'll start the movie. That has uh, uh, exchangeable protons. Uh, you can label them with radio frequency. I'll just do it with the cursor. You label them with radio frequency, and then they exchange with the water. But of course, say if you have millimolar protons and they exchange with the water, you would see only a millimolar change on the water signal. So the process has to be repeated. So if the, you have relatively fast exchange and you can keep labeling, uh, then you can see a visible effect on the water line. And you can see here, this is heavily exaggerated. Normally, it's a few percent on the water line. So, and what can you do with that? So, well, you can uh, do sensitivity enhancement, so image millimolar compounds. Uh, the nice thing is it's a switchable MRI contrast, so you can turn it on and off. So if you would give a compound, then uh, it doesn't bother your background contrast. It has frequency specificity, so contrary to most relaxation agents, it doesn't just change the signal, but you can do it in a frequency-specific manner. Uh, uh, the exchange is often pH dependent. It's base catalyzed, so uh, changes with pH. And you can look at endogenous compounds like some proteins, which we're going to do today, or exogenous ones like uh, glucose or uh, anything else. And if you do exogenous, there generally you can use biocompatible uh, agents because most compounds have exchangeable protons, drugs, for instance. Uh. Okay, just some background. So, uh, CEST is not so new anymore, but relatively frequent. So this is the first meeting in Italy, the CEST workshop in Torino. And there were probably 40, 50 people, and half of them were from Silvio Amy's group. 
And this is the seventh group, uh, workshop in Beijing. There were about 200 people. And everybody uh, ranked by rank. So the students in the back, faculty in the front, sorry. But, <laughs> you know, so uh, it was a nice meeting. And then, uh, as you know, there's a lot of cest papers. So the field is growing. Uh, Okay, so how do you make a, a Z-spectrum? People call it Z-spectrum, but originally they call it water saturation or Z-spectrum. So you, uh, uh, basically, uh, it's in reference to the proton NMR spectrum. So in the proton NMR spectrum, you have all these compounds you don't see and a large water signal. So if you start irradiating at a certain frequency and it doesn't hit any exchangeable protons, then in the saturation spectrum, you get full intensity, 100% or 1. Then if you uh, would perhaps hit an exchangeable proton, then you will get some signal decrease in the saturation spectrum. And you scan through the whole spectrum. And if you would hit the water line, then most of your signal uh, disappears. And you know in the proton NMR spectrum, the water is around 4.7 uh, ppm. And you see that here too. But uh, what do we do in the CEST world? We say, uh, well, 4.7 ppm is not so nice number, so we will, uh, sorry, we will uh, just change it to uh, a zero ppm because you have this nice symmetric water line in the, in the middle. So that's now assigned to zero ppm. And then uh, you look at that, and this is very important. So how do most people analyze the data? They say, well, the right, there's not much effect. The left, there is effect. So I'm going to subtract the left from the right, and I get the MTR asymmetry ratio. And that works very well in phantoms. But as probably most people know here in vivo, it gets a little more complicated. So let's, uh, let's look at some proteins. So, uh, and this is a Jin Yan Zhao came up with that. He said, well, uh, there's a lot of proteins in egg white. So here on the uh, bottom, you see the protein spectrum for egg white, hundreds of proteins. You see the amide protons here, some aromatic protons, and here the aliphatic protons. And here the 4.7 ppm, which we will change to zero ppm. And then the Z spectrum of this pure protein mixture, uh, you see the amide protons, so here are the amide protons. And uh, you see some guanidinium protons, which are those. Those are NH2 uh, with an NH next to it, uh, uh, positively charged in the arginine side groups. And interestingly, you also see the uh, aliphatic groups. And I don't have time to explain that much, but uh, what happens is, of course, in NMR, you have protons, the CH2, CH3 groups, those are protons, and the NH groups too. And they're coupled through space. And because of that coupling, the saturation can be transferred. So if you irradiate in the CH groups, it can be transferred to exchangeable groups and then go to the water. So you see both sides of the water line. So you can already see uh, if you would do asymmetry analysis, you're going to mix that contrast. And uh, what you also see is if you increase the B1, the RF strength, then the spectrum changes too. So the spectrum will be dependent on the RF irradiation. Okay. Uh, and then in vivo, so this was uh, in the one cell, the egg. So uh, here in vivo, in addition to the proton spectral range that you just saw with the proteins, you also have this broad background like the myelin in the brain. So very short T2, you won't see it in the proton spectrum, but you will see it in the background. So if you, and that is the classical MT contrast that Bob Balaban came up with in the late 80s. So when you do uh, then the spectrum, so if you're at low B1 in vivo, you see the amides, this is at 11.7 Tesla. You see the quanodinium protons and you see the NOEs. But if you increase the power, you see this broad background coming in so you cannot go to too high power because then the spectrum is dominated by that. And also because of the background, your APT effects and other effects reduce too because of competition. Okay. Uh, then uh, Stefano asked me to talk about history. So if you want to read a lot about history, so there is this chemical exchange saturation transfer book by Mike McMahon and and others, and there is five history chapters. Uh, and the first one is most interesting, is by Sturer Forsen in the 60s, 
who did the first saturation transfer uh, experiments, and he describes uh, how excited they were, and uh, so it's very nice. Uh, so I'll give a little history, uh, very biased, because we wrote it ourselves, so be careful. So history of exchange spectroscopy at Hopkins. So it's actually a lot of work that Suzumo Mori did uh, when he was a student in, uh, in my lab in the 90s. And, and don't look at the pulse sequence in the next slide, just look at the spectrum. So we were doing high resolution NMR of proteins. And in the proteins, of course, you have amide protons and they were N15 labeled. And this is, remember, the protein spectrum in the egg right here you see above uh, the water signal, you see all the amide proton signals. And what we noticed is, well, normally you do water suppression, but if you do an experiment where before the water suppression, you flip back the water signal to the Z magnetization, you get much more signal. You see that in the second one and in the third one. So, and they do, uh, or we did two dimensionally. So here, just look at more signal here at the bottom. So what is happening there, uh, what is actually happening there is, uh, well, if you don't uh, flip the water back, the water suppression from the previous scan goes to the next scan that goes to the exchangeable protons and you lose the uh, signal for that. So when you do the flip back, you see even at very short TR, you get almost the maximum signal. And that is really the inverse of the SEST effect, but we didn't think about it at the time. So, uh, but that's really what it comes down to. So, and this is just another experiment Suzumu did. Uh, we also did cancer cells. I and mean, always when we did cancer cells, we saw a few things. For the experiment here, we label the water signal, we invert it, and then we look at the signal come up in the spectrum. And you can see the amide protons come up. And then you see this transfer to the aliphatic protons. So again, the inverse of the SEST effect. And, uh, one more thing, I think. Let's see. Then we did in vivo. So in in vivo, same thing. If you do strong water suppression, your signal disappears. This is cancer cells. And if you don't do the water suppression, then you see your amide signal. And pretty high. And here, same in the brain. This is uh, red brain, I think. So this is the baseline without uh, water suppression much. And here ischemic, you see your signal go up. So you see when the pH goes down, the amide proton signal goes up. So this is really the origin of the amide proton transfer experiment. So, uh, but I never thought about CEST. So in 97, I went to a 10 year anniversary uh, at NIH and Bob Balaban had a poster there. And the poster session was during the, uh, basically the drinking. So, so I saw, and Ed, he had a poster on some cest-like experiments, and I thought we have to do that too, you know. So, but uh, I saw him 20 years later in 2016, and both of us, or neither of us, remembered what was on the poster, probably because of the drinking. But it was related to cest. So, so then uh, I had to find somebody to do it. But Suzumu uh, was just graduating, became a postdoc. And I said, Suzumu, will you, do you want to do this stuff uh, in vivo, you know, uh, when I saw that post? And he said, no, uh, can't I do something else? And I said, well, uh, I need somebody to do uh, work on fiber tracking and because nobody can get it to work. And then I gave it to Suzumu and about two months later, he got it to work. So it's good we did that. So he went on uh, in that stuff. But in the meantime, uh, I was looking for somebody to do the SEST experiment. So I couldn't find anybody. So got a bit delayed, but uh, then I had a good postdoc from China, Qin Yan Zhao, and he was doing ASL at the time, and he was doing exchange uh, in ASL, writing down the theory. So I asked him, uh, but he said, ah, I'm not sure. But then uh, to help him with his decision, uh, we looked out, because at that time, a Frenchman, Jean-Francois Le Payen de Calanderie, so probably a noble family, so he, uh, he asked if he could do a sabbatical in my lab. And uh, you might know him because uh, many years ago, I think five, six years ago, when Michael Schumacher had a car accident. So he was the head of the surgery team in France. Uh, so, but in 2000, he did a sabbatical in our lab and he did all the ischemia and other experiments that uh, led to the first APT stuff. 
So there was uh, French involvement since it's a French company. I thought, uh, let's highlight that. So, okay, so then in uh, 2000, we started those experiments. And finally, in 2003, uh, we wrote it up. So these were the first experiments where we did the Z-spectrum, healthy brain and ischemic brain, and then the asymmetry analysis. And we saw a small difference with a maximum at three and a half ppm. So we assigned that to the MI to protons and uh, came up with some background and you could image it too. And the same year with uh, John LaTerra, who was a cancer oncolo an oncologist, we looked at tumors and tumors were very interesting because we saw a healthy brain and then in the edema region that you saw on the image, the Z-spectrum had less effect, so more water, I guess, and in the tumor itself, even uh, lower Z-spectrum. But then it became interesting when you did the asymmetry analysis, you got this very large effect, actually over a range from about one and a half to five ppm. And uh, we were just thinking amide protons, so we said do three and a half ppm, but the effect is, uh, is pretty wide. And that was uh, for the tumors. So that was all done in 2003. And what was nice is if you looked at the T2 map, you saw the edema, but in the MI proton transfer rated map, you didn't see the edema and it fitted with the histology. Okay, and then we did first human studies in uh, 2006, well before 2006 with uh, Xavier Collet was uh, still there. He was just moving to uh, to uh, Singapore. He was a postdoc in the beginning of the 2000s. And uh, it looked like uh, the animals because you could see the asymmetry and the tumor was higher and we got uh, some images. Okay, and this everybody knows probably. So then over the years, Qin Yan especially and uh, collaborators, they, uh, they did a lot of stuff uh, to develop the field. So, and uh, this is just an example where, oops, Sorry, this is just an example where you can see there was no catalytic enhancement, but the APT enhancement was there. And here you can see a lot of edema, but you can see where the, the tumor is. So we thought we were pretty smart, but then the oncologist said, well, it's not so, uh, we don't care that much, at least at Hopkins. They say, because when the patients come in, you know, they have a tumor and we're gonna cut it out. So uh, more important would be if you could separate uh, recurrent tumor from a pseudo progression. So, okay, uh, because you know, they both show a catalytium enhancement and flare enhancement. Okay, so Qin Yan came up with a model for uh, radiation necrosis and compared it with tumors. And uh, we were lucky again, because as you can see uh, here, the tumor of course was highlighted, we knew that, but the APT weighted image was actually a bit hypo intense. So, and then uh, you could also follow treatment. So here, for instance, if you did radiation, when you do T2 imaging, it looks like the tumor is growing, but in the APT weighted image, you could see that the tumor was disappearing. So, so those were the first uh, animal experiments showing that. And then later we did that in, uh, in humans too. So here you see pseudo progression versus recurrent tumor uh, on top. Okay, and then, uh, so this is all what Qin Yan did. He got uh, Shan Shan from China. And uh, then they said, uh, because the oncologists are very picky, they say, well, you know, you have to validate it. So then, uh, and that is a lot of work. So what they did is over a period of six, seven years, uh, they got newly diagnosed patients and treated patients and then uh, we did APT weighted directed needle biopsy in addition to the normal ne needle biopsy and then the staining to validate uh, the contrast. And I'm not going to talk about that much because the next two talks will talk about clinical much, but just an example that I, I like is here you see interesting tumor. You actually see a little bit higher flare here, but no T1 contrast, T1 catalytic contrast. And you see two regions, one with high APT and one with low APT. And when you do the biopsies, you can see the difference. Uh, the first region you see a tumor, and in the second region you don't. Uh, but then 
when you did all those patients, all those regions, the result was a little disappointing. Uh, we took a certain cutoff, and I'll talk about cutoffs later. That's tricky business, uh, taking cutoffs. And it was statistically different, but it didn't look so good. But then when Xin Yan and Shan Shan took regions that were uh, with maximum APT signal only, then uh, it was easy to separate. So cutoffs is everything. You have to choose your thresholds carefully. And then they did the same for uh, recurrent tumor uh, and uh, treatment biopsy or treatment necrosis. And they found good uh, sensitivity and specificity. So, uh, oh yeah, I always forget this. And then Shan Shan came up with the idea, uh, well, how about genetic genotypes? Uh, so she said uh, the isocitrate dehydroxinase uh, genotype uh, mutant versus non-mutant. The mutant is uh, less aggressive. And she did some experiments and could show that uh, statistically the uh, wild type had a higher uh, APT signal. And then that was confirmed by uh, Daniel Paik and his group who did uh, 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 experiments at higher field. So I want to have one take home message and then I want to go into some recent uh, work on standardization because it's a complicated method. Is there time left? I hope, uh, Stefano, okay. So the take home message one is, so there is a lot of potential to separate high and low grade tumors, tumor progression from pseudo progression and to judge uh, IDH mutation uh, in low-grade gliomas. And uh, that first sequence is now FDA approved. Uh, and uh, for stroke imaging that I'm not gonna talk about today, so the signal goes down, except when you have hemorrhage, then you get protein in the blood piling up, so in young hemorrhage you get signal increase. So. Uh, but I'm not talking about that. And you also, if you want to do stroke imaging, don't use the same uh, sequence parameter settings as when you want to do tumor imaging. So be careful. Okay, so uh, so recently we uh, I put uh, Qin Yan and Moritz together. They like to have scientific discussions. So about six years ago, I said, uh, why don't you agree on what we're gonna measure? And recently we all agreed. So uh, it took a while because it's complicated contrast. And, uh, and there's many things in this paper, and one is what are the contributions to the amide proton transfer rated signal? Well, of course, there's the amide protons of the proteins and peptides, the mobile ones. But what's very important is uh, the asymmetry in the conventional uh, MTC. And, and why is that important? Well, if you look uh, here, you can see in the brain there is this asymmetry in the white matter, but in the tumor that is less. So, and you can see that in the result, when you do the difference, you see some residual signal here. So that contributes to the, to the signal. And of course, when B1 increases, the MT effect increases in normal brain. So then actually that difference will get bigger. So, so keep that in mind. Then there is the relate NOEs, the signal on the right mixes in but that's also from the proteins. So in principle, if uh, that should go down, but it's also complex uh, because from chemistry, you know, if you get smaller proteins, like in tumors, then the signal might be less in the NOEs and you still have a lot of amide proton signal. So then there's of course pH and at higher B1, the background signal will reduce the cest signal. T1 effects, then there's the amines which is three ppm offset approximately very wide, and they have opposite pH effect. And then there is liquefactive necrosis and hemorrhage. So all these things can contribute. So when you look at your data, you therefore have to be careful uh, if you want to compare between hospitals that you all do the same thing, otherwise you can get in, uh, in trouble. So, uh, so take home message two, it's mixed contrast and be careful uh, how you interpret the data. And the most important thing I want to say is the signal depends on the saturation. So you see, and we did that ourselves in our paper too, you do this percent cutoff. But of course, if you have higher B1, you might have a higher percent signal change because of the MTC and lower because of the amide protons. So if people want to compare things, you really have to standardize. But of course, within the hospital, if you only do the same thing always, then you can set those thresholds. So 
It's just you have to be aware of what you're doing. Uh, so therefore, there is a need for standardization. So Qin Yen and uh, Moritz uh, and others, Linda Knutsen, a large group of people, Daniel is on there too, came together. And uh, we concluded these parameters are best for many reasons. So if you want to know why, you can read that paper. And uh, it just came out. And uh, what is nice, oh, this is the paper. We uh, tried it then uh, on all manufacturers with those settings. And we get very similar contrast, very comparable in magnitude. So, so now the task is to convince the manufacturers to all do the same. And then you could do more multi-site clinical studies and, and prove and validate uh, the contrast more. So, and, and for the standardization, I want to highlight some work by uh, Kai Hertz and Moritz. So for the Siemens system and, and also other systems, they have this general pulse sequence uh, that you can implement on the Siemens easily, but also should be possible on other scanners. And then you can copy it and, uh, and get reproducible data on different types of scanners. So uh, I think that's very important. So then one more slide, uh, which is, well, how are we going to display this? So this is a nice example from uh, uh, Soterios and uh, uh, Bistars and Laura Mancini in University College London and processed by uh, Olea. So here you see the other images, so T2-weighted, catalidium-enhanced uh, blood volume. And then, of course, well, how are we going to do the APT? You can do it in grayscale. Uh, we always do 5% to minus 5%. Here it's done 0 to 5%, and also with fluid suppression. So, uh, of course, it's all the same image, but people might get confused, so I think... There is no consensus, although most people now do minus 5 to 5%. But of course, in the program, you can change it, and the radiologist might like uh, more contrast. So as long as the numbers are the same, the, the scale doesn't make much difference. So, th so that's basically it. And I want to thank everybody who contributed. So all these are the APT people at Hopkins, and also at Lund, Linda Knudsen, Pia Sundkroon, and Ferris and Erlanger and Moritz and Kai and, well, Daniel also, of course. So, so thank you very much. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. That's great. Thank you very much, Peter, for the really informative and great presentation. So now we can pass to the second uh, case speaker, also very, um, very well known, that is uh, uh, Professor Sotirios Bisdas. Uh, so Sotirius is a consultant uh, neuroradiologist, clinical and MRI lead in the Department of Neuroradiology at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery at the University College London, uh, here. Um, he is Associate Professor of Neuroradiology at UCL and Professor of Radiology and Neuroradiology at the University Hospital of Tübingen in Germany. He is lead the section editor and member of the editorial uh, board in several journals in radiology and neuroradiology. Serves as member of the executive committees of the European Society of Head and Neck Radiology and European Society of Medical Imaging and Informatics. And is member of the Head and Neck Committee of the European Socia Society uh, of Neuroradiology. Sorry. Uh, his expertise fields include advanced CT, intraoperative MRI, advanced and functional MRI, molecular MMPET imaging, and ultra high field MRI in brain disease. During the last 18 years, he has been active in the translational and clinical imaging research of the CNS and head and neck disease through advanced MRI and PET imaging, empowered also by AI techniques. So, Sotirios. Thank you very much uh, for the kind invitation. I would like to thank Olea for the support we have received the last uh, years. And uh, actually today I would like to uh, give you our uh, first impressions in a um, couple of hundreds of patients that where we used APT CEST and how we perceive it uh, as a clinical modality which should find its way to routine imaging. So. Um, why we are so convinced about APT is because we think it is a very uh, true biomarker to answer a lot of clinical questions we have and to address unmet clinical needs. So 
66% of the gliomas in adults um, are WH grade 2 to 3, and unfortunately, these are the notorious gliomas that do not enhance. So this is, again, a highlight that gadolinium um, enhancing tumors are probably the minority, and it is so easy to see a GBM, but it is uh, very difficult to know whether a non-enhancing tumor is really malignant and needs surgical intervention. Um, the things get even more complex because 90% of these gliomas will eventually recur. And uh, again, as Peter mentioned before, we do not really know how this uh, can be disentangled from the pseudoprogression or effect or other treatment-related changes. All these things have paramount clinical importance and are decisive for the patient management. So, um, apart from the unspecific pattern of gadolinium enhancement in tumors, a lot of other disease entities, they have overlapping features. And the new immunotherapy forms that are introduced during the past few years, they have improved to a certain degree the survival rate, but they have also induced so many unspecific changes in our clinical imaging every day that it becomes a very serious diagnostic dilemma a lot of times to know whether it is a relapsing disease or not. So um, before I move on to some clinical examples, I would just like to give another aspect on the clinical problem. So first of all, I found that um, a relatively recent study back in 2018 addressed the inability of the scientific community to develop a new effective drug for brain tumors. And another key thing here was that a lot of positive phase two trials didn't find their way to successful phase three clinical trials. And at the end, if we uh, believe in this meta-analysis of real-world data, the um, progress we have done in increasing the patient survival for GBM is very poor. It's actually the five-year compared to other, of course, clinical cancer forms like lung cancer. So the suggestions in this paper was, among others, to improve our biomarkers, and on not only the clinical biomarkers, they're also the ones that are used in, during the clinical trials in order to pick up the disease response easier, and this would qualify a drug in a faster pace to a wider and broader clinical application. So, of course, there are a lot of biomarkers that can come into question about that. But uh, particularly for the APT test, I think that the unique advantage is that it targets the proteins in the, let's say broadly said, in the tumor. And this has been something that was never done before by any other MRI technique. It was actually something which was well confined and well advertised for the nuclear medicine um, people. And I think this is the major breakthrough. Now we can talk about protein and metabolic imaging in brain tumors in a very simple way and with simpler logistics than the PET. So it is not only that for any biomarker, it is not only that it is good or accurate in depicting and picking up the disease, it's also important that it should be affordable, should be patient-friendly, and radiation free and all these things are actually pearls for doing APT says in our everyday life. So um, Peter already mentioned about the key applications. So today on my end, I will discuss how we can utilize APT MRI for pretreatment phenotyping and genotyping and how also this tool can be useful to monitor the disease response during the treatment rather than post-treatment, which will be done later by Lucia. Um, I would like also to contribute with some sort of personal history about the APDSS. So what I will say here is actually my uh, an anecdote from my first uh, experience with APDSS. These are images 
uh, acquired in a prototype PET MRI scanner back in 2010 or 10, 2011. I cannot really uh, remember now exactly. So um, I was not really aware of this technique, but the MRI physicist in the University of Tübingen, when we ran the first clinical experiments in humans using PET MRI, told me and introduced me to the uh, APT says that and when I saw these images, I said, wow, that was the wow, actually, reaction. And then he started or tried to explain me how this uh, signal was acquired. But then I stopped him and said, OK, let's focus now on the, uh, these nice images. And these nice images are speaking for themselves, to be honest. So I have here examples of this multiparametric, true multiparametric PET MRI we did. And these are, this is, for example, an insular tumor, which was not enhancing. This is the choline map in the spectroscopy. And you see here that we don't have increased signal. And this is also in line with methionine PET, which is considered one of the reference standards in literature about brain tumor staging utilizing PET. This is another case where, again, we didn't have any contrast enhancing tumor. So my research and actually i think the holy grail of apt says is is to characterize more narrowly the indeterminate tumors and again you see that there is negative uh, apt weighted finding which is in concordance with methionine pet i will show you another two examples this is uh, this was a case of an idh mutant gbm uh, and though we see that the tumor uh, actually seems well confined without edema, without all these malignant features, it had very high concentration in amides and amines and again correlated very much with the protein methionine uh, PET imaging. So the last example is again of uh, such a difficult to stage uh, glioma. And here um, is something that uh, we would, uh, we really actually uh, were surprised to see, but we could uh, later find a reason for that. So the APD signal is very um, avid, but you see that there is no signal in the PET, and this is called the photopenic effect, and is well described in high-grade tumors. So in total, uh, after doing this kind of multiparametric combined imaging in 60 or more patients, we didn't find a single case where apt cest was inferior to the PET imaging for staging the brain tumors. And actually, you can do the math to see how cheaper, affordable, and easier can be apt cest compared to PET, for, and particularly an amino acid PET tracer, which is extremely uh, difficult to produce. So in what we found, of course, was in concordance with all the synchronous research that was uh, done in the, in the rest of the scientific community, and it was very uh, prolific, as Peter mentioned before. So uh, other groups found that APT has an added value in FTG PET imaging for brain tumors, and FTG PET is the most unsuitable tracer to characterize brain tumors. So APT actually overcomes the limitations of FTG. Um, has been also superior to DWI-based models like uh, DTI or DKI or NODI. There are several systematic reviews and meta-analysis that have shown the diagnostic benefit in the pretreatment setting and also other studies that they strongly urge us to implement APT part in our multiparametric MRI. Another key feature here that I would elaborate in a minute is about the characterization of the non-enhancing peritumoral signal and this can be facilitated by apt cest so as you appreciate in these two cases, there are uh, non-enhancing uh, tumor in the, right in the left cerebellum, which has strong apt weighted signal. And there is also a lot of edema, or what we used to call edema, 
surrounding this uh, GBM on the left temporal lobe. However, the edema does not seem to be so benign and innocent, but it has increased APT signal, which highlights that here we have to do with strong tumor infiltration. So the non-enhancing tumor or the non-enhancing parts of a lesion, they haven't actually received the interest that they should have received in the past. However, actually we know that the non-enhancing tumor parts represent an equal, um, equal volume of the whole disease like the enhancing tumor parts in many tumors, and including also the uh, GBMs. So now the new concepts and the new schools in treating the brain tumors is that we should pay attention into this uh, disease burden and also try to tackle it in two ways. First is, and this is something which has to do with neurosurgery, is to extend the resection margins to include non-enhancing tumor disease if the imaging suggests that there is tumor infiltration. And the second school of thought is to do some dose baiting in radiation treatment fields in order to increase the efficacy of the radiation and the increase in patient survival. So these two aggressive now approaches are, um, are actually gaining more and more uh, traction in the uh, neuro-oncology therapy. So we started with the second one, which is how to address the response uh, during the intra-treatment. That was a really brilliant initiative with the radiation oncology team, which is very open-minded and has embraced the multiparametric MRI and particularly APT cest for this reason. Uh, this is an ongoing trial, but I have picked up one patient just uh, to show you um, the added value of uh, APT in this case. So the baseline imaging before starting with the radiation treatment was obtained on the 10th of December. On the 23rd of December, we had already 30 gray irradiated in the brain tumor. And on the 26th of, um, of January, we had finished with a 60 gray. You appreciate that the contrast enhancement has temporarily changed between this follow-up one and two, but at the end of, the, of this uh, combined hemoradiation, so th it is the standard radiation with temozolomide, uh, we see that if we were here called to assess the disease, we would probably say that there is not a satisfactory tumor response. However, this is not what the APT says actually suggests us where there is a massive reduction in the concentration of the amides and amines, massive reduction in the, in the uh, APT weighted signal, as you see here. So these are things that, have, that go unnoticed in our clinical routine, or they go unnoticed in clinical trials. And actually by omitting this information, we cannot uh, have, we cannot really manage the patient in order to maximize the potential of the drug to increase the survival or to introduce a new drug in the market. So it is a game changer. So it is a powerful technique, robust, non-invasive, gadolinium free and gadolinium actually plays a major role. And the people, when they see, they hear uh, gadolinium free uh, technique, they are very interested in, in the patients, they gain more and more uh, voice and they actually express their concerns about gadolinium nowadays. We have the killer applications in pretreatment and intratreatment um, disease assessment that I mentioned before. And again, I would highlight the benefits of for workflow and patient friendly modality that it is done in a fraction of time compared to the other pet techniques and also it, it gives, according to our clinical experience, it, it is more easily appreciated and accepted by the radiographers because it is much simpler in the acquisition for them rather than doing an MR spectroscopy, which needs manual seaming and considerable post-processing time. And of course, an expertise to interpret the spectra. So I think by having now more standardization in the acquisition and interpretation of the APT signal, so this technique will gradually um, 
will gradually actually put out uh, traditional metabolic techniques like the MR spectroscopy. So um, it is a new biomarker and uh, actually I'm really grateful for this amazing teamwork during the last uh, four years, which was this joint initiative from the academia and industry in order to launch this on a broader clinical uh, population and uh, UCL uh, played uh, the role of a reference center for this. So I have here taken a screenshot from the what has been suggested as the roadmap to introduce a new imaging biomarker. It was a very um, elaborate work back in 2016 by many um, people here in UK and internationally. So where we are now standing with the APT says is here exactly at the transla translational gap two in order to actually show in a very uh, in a, in a much larger patient population, multi-center, multi-site pa patient population, that it has a true benefit and how this can be implemented uh, in our healthcare uh, system and in any hospital. And of course, how much this will save us cost and time when we have neuro-oncology patients. So of course, we are standing a little bit behind that about stroke, but uh, neuro-oncology is a devastating disease with increasing prevalence and it is a good paradigm for this biomarker. Um, I was asked to uh, show you how we do that in uh, UCL. Uh, we are using a 3 d magneton prisma uh, scanner. So we have also here the timings of the acquisition. You see that it is very short compared to other techniques. And for more information, you can uh, ask uh, Stefano afterwards. We really, really are grateful for the work uh, that Dan uh, and recently published that uh, actually Peter uh, mentioned the work from Sao and Dal in order to standardize the technique. Thank you very much for your attention. So now we have the third speaker, an emerging um, uh, figure here in neuro-oncology, so is uh, uh, Dr. Luciani Kelly. So she's a, a young neuroradiologist who works at the uh, PTS Alpetriere University Hospital in Paris, in France. She's a PhD candidate in neuroscience at Sorbonne University under the supervision of Stéphane Richy, who is the director of the neuroimaging platform of Paris Brain Institute. She's dedicated to teaching neuroradiology to students and interns of the Sorbonne University from Dieter fellowships. And here research, she is exploring non-invasive tools for brain tumor, pre and post theropathic assessment. She's studying the clinical role of edited MRI spectroscopy in glioma diagnosis uh, through two hydro glutarate and uh, citizen detection and uh, the added value of epity-weighted imaging in brain predated metastasis and the prediction of primary central nervous system lymphomas prognosis through artificial intelligence. Lucia combines her scientific activity with clinical practice with a particular focus on neuro-oncology field. And she's the neuroradiology reference in several French multidisciplinary meetings in brain cancer. So I would like to invite Dr. Micheli. So thank you very much, Olea, for the invitation. Uh, in the next uh, 15 minutes, uh, I will rapidly go through APT uh, weighted in brain tumor and, and on the radiation problem in neuro-oncology. And then I will focus my presentation on APT weighted in pre radiated metastasis. And then I will end with uh, some future direction. So they have we, we already seen that the main contributor of APT weighted contrast are proteins and protein tumor are reach on proteins and therefore they have an increased APT weighted signal. We have already um, so that we already saw that in neuro-oncology uh, we can use APT weighted to baseline characterize tumor so to have information on the grade of the tumor of genetic marker and especially IDH mutation and on the prognosis of the tumor. Uh, but uh, we can also use um, APT on the post treatment assessment, and there is where I think really advanced imaging, the post treatment setting is where really where the advanced imaging makes the difference because 
of course, uh, clinical examination is a specific, and we cannot just biopsy every evolving lesion, so we need to have information if the treatment are, um, if the patient is responding or not to treatments. So in the treatment arsenal, we have radiotherapy. It's of course a um, very important option in primary and secondary brain tumor, but the problem of radiotherapy is that it can induce several toxic inflammatory um, complex brain uh, lesion, and among this lesion we can have radionecrosis that it's often very uh, hard to distinguish from a neuroradiology point of view uh, from tumor progression because the two lesions, the radionecrosis and tumor progression in conventional imaging are indistinguishable. They are evolving lesion, they uh, enhance, and so we need advanced imaging to uh, respond to, to answer to this question and among the advanced technique, uh, of course, brain perfusion imaging is uh, our reference because it holds a higher diagnostic accuracy, especially when combined with other sequence advanced technique like spectroscopy. But the problem is that pitfalls and limitations do exist, uh, and we see that um, often in our uh, routine, clinical routine. And this, I have to stress this for the non-doctors, uh, has, is really a clinical problem and has major consequence on patient care. So this is an example of a clinical scenario. This is a, a brain a metastatic disease of a, um, of a breast um, tumor, and we see there are two lesions, one on the right caudate and the other one of the left um, frontal, uh, frontal lobe. And they were treated with radiotherapy, successfully treated. The volume of the lesion uh, decreased. But at the uh, second follow-up, so while the left lesion continued to decrease, the right one increased. So what's happening uh, from in this lesion? Is this a radionecrotic lesion or is this tumor progression? Should we change? our treatment strategy, or should we just wait and uh, this is just an inflammatory process and then uh, it will uh, decrease. So this is the clinical context that lead us to evaluate APT-weighted imaging in the prediction of radionecrosis from or, or progression. We did our study, at, uh, we are doing our study at 3 Tesla. Uh, in brain prey irradiating evolving metastasis. So what happens is that we have, when we have the clinical problem of a uh, metastasis that uh, has been irradiated and it's now evolving uh, and we have this clinical crucial question, is this uh, a progressing lesion or is this a radionecrotic lesion? So we add APT. And the underlying hypothesis is that the radio-induced brain remnants have a low cellular density and therefore decrease the PT-weighted signal intensity in comparison to hypercellular tumor progression. And we also, of course, want to compare to the standard reference in routine, so with um, dynamic suitability contrast perfusion. So for, for now, we have uh, scan 20 uh, vein, uh, brain evolving, enhancing lesion. All of the le uh, lesion have un underwent the same single dose gamma knife stereotactic therapy, and the final diagnosis is assessed by either histological examination or imaging follow-up or PET-CT confirmation. Um, we are scanning patient on a SCARA system and um, with an APT sequence with a B1 value of 2 micro Tesla in a duty cycle of 55 and 25 offset, so a little different protocol in comparison to uh, Ceterius. And uh, we also do Wasabi sequence for simultaneously B0 and B1 mapping. And DSC perfusion is done after a single dose of gadolinium and a low flip angle. And the whole post-processing of wasabi, APT, and perfusion data is done with oleosphere. So for now we have 10 radionecrotic and 10 progressing lesions, so quite, um, for now with 10, 10. And with the, if we consider the signal intensity of this lesion normalized to the contralateral normal appearing white matter, uh, we see that uh, the progressing lesions have higher 
uh, APT values in comparison to radionecrosis as expected um, and already new in the literature. But uh, the inter interesting thing is that also when we uh, do fluid suppression, we can really separate these two groups. So the first result of the study is the importance of fluid suppression in the post treatment evaluation of brain metastasis. The second result is that uh, in, in our little population, APT weighted is more accurate than RCBV maps that are calculated from the SC perfusion. As we can see, uh, of course, um, RCBV can discriminate between the two entity, but it can dis discriminate with a less accuracy than APT, and especially if we suppress a uh, APT. And this, are, this is an example of um, left occipital lesion that was evolving with the DSC perfusion. Uh, it's in, in the clinical practice, it's not that easy. Uh, we were thinking uh, that the lesion wasn't, um, we didn't saw any uh, neonjogenesis, so we thought this is a mobility uh, radionecrotic lesion, and then we did uh, APT weighted, and there was an increased signal, and as APT weighted uh, fluid suppressed imaging have suspected, this was a tumor progression, progression that was confirmed by histological examination. And this is another example of the, um, another left occipital uh, lesion uh, that was evolving. Uh, we can see that the lesion has got a lot of hemorrhagic remnants because it's very e point on T2. And you know that hemorrhagic remnants can alter the SC perfusion, but as we don't know how it can alter, and uh, so we, we, in the clinical practice, we have this image. We don't know is, if this is an artifact or is it. And then we did APT weighted, and we and the lesion was quite cool, let's say. So we said this is a radionecrotic lesion, and follow-up confirmation um, showed that it was actually a radionecrotic. So uh, again, this is our two APT weighted uh, maps, that, uh, and the treatment strategy is completely different. For the first patient, we have to. Uh, clearly do something change our therapeutic strategy. So uh, operate the patient or re-radiate the patient or change the chemotherapy for the second patient. We just um, wait. Or if, it's, if we have a lot of mass effect or it's a very inflammatory reaction, sometimes we do corticoid, we do the achizumab treatment, but it's completely different. The third result is that uh, APT weighted Provi uh, provided earlier diagnosis in comparison with uh, the standard multimodal uh, protocol. So here we see a lesion that was irradiated. We see that there was a nice linear en enhancing um, part of the lesion, no mass effect, a lot of hemosideridic remnants, no diffusion restriction, no androgenesis. So we thought the patient was doing good. And then we did the um, it, it was pre pretty reassuring. Then we did the fluid suppressor PT weighted, and we saw that it was a strange nodular image um, of high signal intensity. And then three, men, three months after, the patient developed a lesion, and the biopsy and the, the surgical resection of this lesion confirmed it was tumor progression. This is another example of uh, APT weighted that provided earlier diagnosis was a patient, um, a metastatic uh, patient, uh, disease, and patient was getting worse, uh, and we scanned the patient. Uh, again, we found that there was uh, this lesion that enhanced uh, lots of edema, no uh, neangiogenesis, but fluid suppressed APT weighted suggests that the posterior part of the lesion, uh, there was two more, and then we follow up the patient, and the patient continued to get worse, and the, 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 the mass effect can continue to worsen, but this doesn't suggest, this can be also um, radionecrosis. There, there can be really inflammatory reactions, so, uh, but um, at the same time, ZBT was saying that the lesion also was uh, becoming uh, with higher and higher signal in, in APT. And this was nine months after, and only one year after, we saw 
that in the posterior part of the lesion, there was neoangiogenesis. So it was quite impressive <laughs> for us. So I don't want to say that we have to stop to, to do perfusion. Uh, of course, there are complementary information. One gives us information on perfusion on the vascular components uh, and on mi microvascularity and neonogenesis, and the other uh, gives us information on the protein content. So this is an example of a glioblastoma, where the anterior part of the lesion shows a high hypervascularity, but not that high in amide contents, and the posterior part is just high amide contents and no neonogenesis. So to conclude in line with previous work, we suggest that APT weighted can distinguish between progressing and radionecrotic lesion, and we um, provide the first evidence of the importance of suppressing fluid signal. And of course, there is a broad um, further direction, wider population multicentric studies, exploring also the amine range and NOE, and as proposed in the recent consensus paper, a high duty cycle. Uh, and we have to validate our uh, advanced sequence with histological examination. So just what about the first case? Was it tumor progression or radionecrosis? So we did, um, we did a DSC perfusion that showed no neangiogenesis and IPT that showed uh, a, a higher signal intensity and at the third follow-up also neangiogenesis come and it was a tumor progression. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia, for the great presentation.